Welcome to Sunset Hills United Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to have you here worshiping with us this fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. Beloved in Christ, we have many announcements, so hold on to your hats. Today, um, one announcement, we regret to inform you that the PAL, our elevator, is currently not working. We will look into that this week to see what is happening. Thank you to everyone who has been assisting those who needed help with mobility needs, but at the time, um, the PAL is not working. Today, following worship, there will be fellowship hour downstairs. There will be snacks and just a time to gab. Gab for a little bit, have fun, and then I'll be downstairs shortly afterwards for our session, planning your funeral service, or as I like to say, putting the fun in funeral at Sunset Hills United Presbyterian Church, a preparatory document. Everyone is dying to come to this. <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> Friends, my first funeral that I did when I became ordained was for a woman named Emma Chambers. And I went to her house for lunch after I had become a pastor. I'd been a pastor all of a week when I went to her home for lunch. And she said, I need to let you know that by the end of this year, I will be dead. And I said, oh, they did not cover that in seminary. <laughs> what do you say to that? And it, it, it was true, she had leukemia and she was going to pass. And she said to me, here is my folder. And when I go, I have written my obituary and I have written down everything I want for my service, what hymns I want, what scripture readings I want, and which of my grandchildren I want to read the scriptures during my service. And that was an incredible gift to me but it was also an incredible gift to her family because any of you who have lost a loved one, you know that when you lose a loved one, there is so much paperwork. There is so much administration and it gets in the way of the time to really celebrate and remember and share stories about the one you loved and to grieve together. And so this is a service coming to this after worship today this isn't only so that you're like, I know what hymns I like and you better sing that hymn or I'm going to haunt you. But this is also a gift for your family so that your family and your congregation are able to focus on remembering you rather than on paperwork. And so I hope you will join us for that today. Book Club, we are meeting this Wednesday at 7.30. We had to postpone a week. This Wednesday at 7.30 via Zoom. Mark your calendars. February 14th, Valentine's Day is also Ash Wednesday. We will have a pancake supper at 6 o'clock p.m. I hope you'll come and join us for pancakes. And then there will be a service upstairs for Ash Wednesday at 7 o'clock. February 18th, following worship, bring a brown bag lunch. We will carpool to go on a field trip, as it were, to St. Anthony's Chapel on Troy Hill to um, go with our Sunday school class. The adult Sunday school has been learning about different ways of worshiping and about relics and what those mean. And so we will go to St. Anthony's Chapel. It is the second largest collection of relics in the world, second only to the Vatican. And so I hope you will join us for that adventure. February 17th, we will have Lifeline screeners, screenings here at the church. See Harriet Rick to sign up for a Lifeline screening that Saturday. This Tuesday, February 6th, Riley Farabaugh, it is senior night at basketball, at the basketball game this Tuesday evening. The game is at 7.30. It is recommended we get there at 7. And so, friends, we are invited to go surprise Riley by being his church family there cheering him on. I hope that you will join us. And my understanding, Shelby, is there is not choir rehearsal. There is bell rehearsal. There is bell rehearsal this Tuesday, but there is not choir rehearsal this Tuesday so that we can all go and cheer Riley on. Riley doesn't know this is happening. It's a surprise, and he is not here right now, and his mom has promised that he will not watch the video of this service, and so we're going to keep it a surprise. This Wednesday, Days for Girls will be gathering again at 10 o'clock a.m. to continue sewing, and you're invited to bring a brown bag lunch with you. 
Finally, congratulations are in order to Carla Greenfield, our chili cook-off champion. Yay, Carla. Thank you to everyone who made chili for last week's chili cook-off and to everyone who voted. Every vote counts. Are there any announcements that I have missed? Yes, Lee. Donate your Christmas cookie tins. Lee Seepitz is going to sell them during next year's cookie sale. Wonderful. Friends, let us focus on this beautiful sunny day on why we are here, to glorify our God in Christ with the lighting of the Christ candle. Our prayer of preparation comes from Howard Thurman. Let us pray. Holy God, we lay before you this morning our enthusiasms. For God, how wonderful it is to be able to feel things deeply. The sheer delight of fresh air when we have been indoors all day the never-ending wonder of sunrise and sunset, the sound of wind through the trees and the utter wetness of the rain, the excitement of finding something that was lost and is found, our favorite pen, a beautiful word forgotten, the return of an old book, the reconciliation after estrangement, the first step after months of illness. How moving is the sheer wonder of being necessary to the life of another, the source of food for a cat or a dog, the giving of a gentle word when you did not know that such a word was desperately needed, the sharing of so little at the crucial point of acute urgency, the invasion of the mind and heart with a sense of your presence in which all of our being suddenly becomes your dwelling place, dear God. We lay before you, O God, our enthusiasms this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Join me for call to worship based on Psalm 147. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise the Lord. The Lord determines the number of the stars and calls them each. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God on the harp. Praise our Lord. Amen. <clears throat>
called to confession. The Lord our God knows all that is in our minds as well as all that is in our hearts. In humility, let us confess our sin before our all-knowing God in Jesus Christ. God of James, God of John, limit the scope of your love. We have created rules, patterns, and boundaries around who you would call your child. We have set ourselves up as judges. <coughs> to serve you as you have served. We ask this in Jesus' name. The love of Jesus Christ is for all. This love encompasses us as well, inviting us into Christ's kingdom of mercy. In our Savior, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God, amen. Let us be sure this day to forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Also. Using American Sign Language, peace be with you and also with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. And now as we sing Jesus Loves Me with the children come forward for the time with the children. Get you walking. Is this your first time walking to the children's sermon? Last week was the first time, and you are getting stronger. Look at you. And a great elephant skirt. I have a story for us today called God Hears Me. And on the back, it says, Everyone is a theologian, even your little one. You are theologians. That means that you have thoughts and beliefs about God. And today, we are talking about the ways God hears us when we pray, when we talk to God. When I am sad, or if fear starts to spread, I fold up my hands and I bow my head. When I am thankful, when I am happy and thankful and bright, I raise up my voice and my hands to the light. Look at you, you're raising your hands. You want to raise your hands? Maybe. Like Tevia. Da 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 da. -da. <laughs> With a big smile and even through tears, I talk to my God and I know that God hears. God is my heavenly Father who cares. I know that God listens to all of my prayers. 
Do you put your hands together when you pray? I do too, just like that. When I have wishes and questions won't leave, I open my hands up to God to receive. When I am thinking of family and friends, I pray for each one. Both my hands I extend. Do you ever put your hands out to pray? Sometimes I do that. Do you ever eat fish like that? Maybe salmon, but does it still have its head and its tail on? No, no, me neither. But I sometimes eat bread like that or carrots like that. With a big smile or even through tears, I talk to my God and I know that he hears. God is my heavenly father who cares. I know that he listens to all of my prayers. I pray in the morning, I pray when I eat, I pray before bed every day on repeat. I pray by myself or between mom and dad. At church, we love praying through songs that are glad. I pray with a whisper. I pray with a yell. I kneel, stand, or sit. Each one works just as well. I pray at day's end, and when each new day starts, the clock doesn't matter, just my humble heart. Which instrument do you think is more fun to pray with? The piano? That is a good one. God's Son, our King Jesus, taught us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, we need you today. He's one with the Father and able to save, and that's why I always pray in Jesus' name. So how do we know that God hears when we call? Because we pray through Jesus and Jesus prays for us all. So with a big smile or even through tears, I talk to my God and I know that he hears. Do you think you can get it? <gasps> Me. God hears you, David. And God hears you. Do you see yourself in there? Do you see the baby in the mirror? Yeah, there she is. Oh, thank you so much for sharing this story with me today. And I hope you always remember that God hears you. And now we're going to learn more about Jesus with Miss Taylor. She's here, yep, for children's church, for kiddos, all the way up through second grade. And, of course, you're also welcome to stay with us if you like. Children are always welcome. But up through second grade, if your grown-ups are okay with it, you can go with Miss Taylor and Mrs. Heim. Listen, if you will, to the words of the Old Testament, Psalm 147. Hallelujah. It's a good thing to sing praise to our God. Praise is beautiful. Praise is fitting. God's the one who rebuilds Jerusalem, who regathers Israel's scattered exiles. He heals the brokenhearted and bandishes their wounds. He counts the stars and assigns each a name. Our Lord is great with limitless strength. We'll never comprehend what he knows and does. God puts the fallen on their feet again and pushes the wicked into the ditch. Sing to God a thanksgiving hymn. Play music on your instruments to God. Who fills the sky with clouds, preparing rain for the earth, then turning the mountains green with grass feeding both cattle and crows. He's not impressed with horsepower. The size of our muscles means little to him. Those who fear God get God's attention. They can depend on his strength. Jerusalem, worship God. Zion, praise your God. He made your city secure. He blessed your children among you. He keeps the peace at your borders. 
He puts the best bread on your tables. He launches his promises earthward, how swift and sure they come. He spreads snow like a white fleece. He scatters frost like ashes. He broadcasts hail like bird seed. Who can survive this winter? Then he gives the command and it all melts. He breathes on winter, suddenly it's spring. He speaks the same way to Jacob, speaks words that work to Israel. He never did this to the other nations. They never heard such commands. Hallelujah. And our gospel reading comes from Mark's gospel, chapter one, beginning at the 29th verse. Directly on leaving the meeting place, they came to Simon and Andrew's house, accompanied by James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed, burning up with fever. They told Jesus. He went to her, took her hand, and raised her up. No sooner had the fever left than she was up fixing dinner for them. That evening, after the sun was down, they brought sick and evil afflicted people to him. The whole city lined up to his door. He cured their sick bodies and tormented spirits. Because the demons knew his true identity, he didn't let them say a word. While it was still night, way before dawn, he got up and went out to a secluded spot and prayed. Simon and those with him went looking for him. They found him and said, everybody's looking for you. Jesus said, let's go to the rest of the villages so I can preach there also. This is why I've come. He went to their meeting places all through Galilee, preaching and throwing out the demons. Our New Testament reading is from Corinthians 1, chapter 9, verse 15 to 18. Still, I want it made clear that I've never gotten anything out of this for myself, and that I'm not writing now to get something. I'd rather die than give anyone ammunition to discredit me or question my motives. If I proclaim the message, it's not to get something out of it for myself. I'm compelled to do it and doomed if I don't. If this was my own idea of just another way to make a living, I'd expect some pay. But since it's not my ideal, but something solemnly entrusted to me, why would I expect to get paid? So am I getting anything out of it? Yes, as a matter of fact, the pleasure of proclaiming the message at no cost to you. You don't even have to pay my expenses. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and indeed every day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Taking our kids outside to love God in nature is just about the most Jesus-y thing we can do, Anne Lamott writes. She says that Jesus was nearly always outside outside with his disciples or alone with the stars. To take kids to a beach is to bring them to an altar, a big one, surrounded by the blue-gray ocean billowing outward like a skirt, flecked with sunlight like foil or diamonds. I love Anne Lamott because Anne Lamott is usually right. She is so right. Jesus, he feels the earth beneath his feet every day of his life. I think of the Carol King song, I feel the earth move under my feet. I bet Jesus could feel what was happening with the earth as his feet walked on the earth every day of his life. Never concrete, never concrete. Jesus, our savior, he knows the weather every day of his life. And he knows the weather not because Al Roker told him anything, not because he looked outside and thought, I need my cloak, and made the mad dash from his house to his car. 
No, Jesus knew the weather because he was in the weather. Jesus, he is a Robert Frost of his day in his capability to walk in the woods on a snowy evening, which friends, it does snow in the Holy Land. We forget how intertwined first century life, that is Jesus's life, is with nature. Thus forgetting how much Jesus would have assumed that our lives, his followers' lives, would be intertwined with nature. I think we forget about the role of nature in Jesus's life Because as I read commentaries this week, which I love to read Bible commentaries, it's part of why I'm a pastor, as I was reading these Bible commentaries, most of them highlighted that Jesus goes off alone to pray. We saw that in Mark. Jesus went off by himself long before the dawn to pray. And the commentators all said something along the same lines. They said, there is danger in Jesus going dark to pray. Say that Jesus' time in prayer in today's text in Mark, it echoes his time in the wilderness being tempted by evil. It presupposes the dark aloneness of praying in Gethsemane. Jesus cannot escape darkness, the darkness that came for him, the darkness that's coming for him in his crucifixion. His prayers in the dark of night represent the shadow that looms over Jesus' ministry. That's ridiculous. The commentators miss that what darkness is to us in 2024 is not what darkness is to Jesus. It's not the same thing. Darkness for our Lord, remembering that Jesus was a Jewish man, Darkness for Jesus would begin his weekly Sabbath. He would look forward every Friday to the darkness, to Shabbat, the start of rest. Darkness for Jesus, it is the host for his most profound conversations over nighttime Sabbath meals. Darkness is the host for Jesus' visit with Nicodemus. Darkness is the context of Mary Magdalene going about her greatest act of service, running to the tomb to care for Jesus' body. The darkness of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the darkness of her womb is where Jesus' body is formed in the first place, where the incarnation first starts happening, imagining little baby Jesus in the womb, getting his toenails and his fingernails within that darkness. Darkness is what the tomb was like, the tomb after Jesus died and rose to new life. It was in darkness that Jesus rose from the dead. Darkness is not bad or evil or problematic. It isn't a symbol of Christ's earthly misery. Darkness is a part of God's natural world. In Genesis, God creates the light and the darkness and calls them both good. Darkness is like a cocoon. It's a space that recreates, that restores, that renews life. It's it's a place where we can turn into goop because butterflies, before they become butterflies, they turn into goop in the cocoon and then are restored. Recreation, restoration, renewal in the darkness is what Jesus seeks today. Everyone wants something from this man. There's a million people on this planet, I'm guessing, I don't know how many people were on this planet in the first century. But there are a million people on this planet when Jesus is walking on it. And every one of those people who find out who he is and what he can do for them, they want his touch. It's like that scene from Jesus Christ Superstar. If you have seen Jesus Christ Superstar, there is this scene where the crowds are suffocating Jesus. 
They sing to him, heal my eyes, I can hardly see. See my feet, I can hardly walk. I believe you can make my, me well. See my tongue, I can hardly talk. See my skin, I'm a mass of blood. Change my life, oh, I know you can. See my purse. I'm a poor, poor man. Will you touch, will you mend me, Christ? Won't you touch, won't you heal me, Christ? Won't you kiss, won't you cure me, Christ? And Jesus, in his incarnation, he is only one man. He is only one person. He will never, ever, ever in his earthly days heal every person, cure every human, make well every soul who wants it of him. He cries out in the musical, there's too many of you. Jesus knows he will never do all that this world wants him to do. The good things, the worthwhile things, the lovely things that this world wants him to do in his three-year earthly ministry. So what does Jesus do? Does Jesus work late into the night, burn that midnight oil, go door to door until at least everyone in this neighborhood has had the healing that they need? Does he put in a 50, 60-hour work week to make sure as many humans as physically possible are cured of their horrific, horrible, earthly ills? Does Jesus pursue burnout Burnout. No. No. Even as the disciples say, Jesus, there's more people. There's more people. They need healing. Come on. What are you doing? Why are you out here? Come on. You've got to come and heal these folks. Jesus, the almighty, all-powerful God with us, he embraces his human limitation. He embraces the call to be with God, to be restored, to be renewed, to be recreated in the darkness. He goes into the darkness of nature long before the dawn. Jesus was a morning person. I feel vindicated. Jesus goes into the darkness of nature to the place of recreation, restoration, and renewal to pray. It may come as a shock to us friends, but I have a secret to share with us this day. This is rather scandalous. I'm kind of spilling the tea here, but it's true and worth sharing that if Jesus needs restoration, so do we. If Jesus can't do everything that everyone wants of him, neither can we. If Jesus needs quiet, dark spaces to go and be alone with God, so do we. Oh, it sounds so self-indulgent, so self-indulgent to say, I need to just go be quiet and pray right now. I mean, I remember the story of my dad, who is a pastor. He had someone knocking on his office door who wanted to talk about the church budget, just pounding, pounding on his door. And when my dad said, wait, I'm not available, and the secretary is saying, wait, you need to make an appointment, you need to set a time, the man opened the door and said to my dad, what are you doing that's so important right now? And my dad said, I'm praying. To which the man responded, we don't pay you for that. That was an interesting dinner that night in my household. <laughs> we don't see it as something that we need to do. It's an indulgence, for goodness sake. There's, there's demands on us, on our time, on what we need to do to go and, and be in the quiet, dark places with God? Well, who has the time for that? Well, friends, Jesus did. And if we don't believe the testimony of the literal life of Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior, the almighty maker of the universe, the one who put the breath into your very lungs and knows about the hangnail you had this week, well then perhaps you'll believe one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Random, right? Dr. Benjamin Rush. Dr. Rush, a Quaker and one of the founders of the mental health movement in our nation, he declared, quote, digging in soil has a curative effect on mental illness. 
The Quaker Friends Hospital here in Pennsylvania, founded in the 1870s to use greenhouses as part of its mental health treatment, saw that people did better when they were interacting with nature. During World War II, psychiatry pioneer Carl Menninger, he led a horticultural therapy movement in the veteran administration hospital system. The connections between the time that we spend in nature, in quiet places, and our overall mental well-being, friends, the connections have only been further confirmed in recent studies. Research recently reveals that Michigan prison inmates whose cells face the prison courtyard, they have 24% more illnesses than those whose prison cells face farmland. A study from the New York State College of Human Ecology finds that children with more nature near their home have lower ratings of behavioral conduct disorders anxiety and depression than peers with less nature near their home. Children with more nature near their homes also rate themselves higher than their corresponding peers on a global measure of self-worth. Now if I'm not mistaken, most of you here in this sanctuary, once upon a time you were children. Most of you were once children. Think about that creek. Think about the woods. Think about the backyard, the earthworms, the dogs, the cat, the goldfish, whatever it was in nature that engaged you as a child. Do you think that was worthwhile to you then? I know it was for me. It was worthwhile for us then, friends. And God knows, Jesus knows, mental health experts know it is worthwhile for us now. Jesus gave you, gave me, gave all of us nature in our childhoods. Jesus gives nature here, now, in our maturity, so that we may have that quiet place to go and pray. Jesus never once said, go forth and do it all. Go forth and exhaust yourself. Go forth and be everything to everybody. Go forth and make everybody happy. Jesus never said that. Jesus did say, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And he gives us nature, the dark, quiet places, so that we can be restored, renewed to do just that. Where is your quiet place? Is it your patio during a good rain? Is it Bird Park with your hiking boots? Is it on the fishing stream? Is it your front porch before the sunrise with your cup of coffee? Is it the bird feeder outside your living room window? Is it the deer who love your garden so very much? Where do you go? to be quiet with your God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our hymn of response is hymn number 520. Here, O Lord, we see you face to face, verses one through four. Let us remain seated as we sing together.
And now let us affirm our faith using a portion of the brief statement of faith found in the bulletin. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. We have those joys and concerns that we lift up this day. We pray for Riley Farabaugh, who is under the weather today, but there is a joy that, now if I get this right, Dottie, he was athlete of the week last week? Sc scholar athlete of the week last week. And so we are so very proud of him. And what was the award he won that the students voted for? Just, yeah, I, let's celebrate him. He's most likely to brighten your day. And I think any of you who know Riley know that that is a most accurate award descriptive for him. That's just wonderful. Other prayers that we lift up this day, Carl Muller has been moved into Genesis Care, which is on Green Tree Road. I had the location incorrect before. It's on Green Tree Road near Marshalls over there. And he is doing really well. Um, they took the feeding tube out and he was able to, to chat with Francine and with Harriet. And so praise be to God, that is really good news. We continue to pray for Carl's recovery. We continue to pray for John Ellis, and I'm going to come around with the microphone, Pat, so you be ready for me, as he continues to recover as well. And I would ask um, for prayers for my dear friend, Reverend Elizabeth Wallace, as I shared with you a couple weeks ago that her, um, her cancer has come back. It was, it was found in her blood. She had just a few months of, of being cancer-free before they found that it, it, she probably was not cancer-free. It just was in her blood and too small to detect and so now what they are doing she will have a port put in next week and then she will do a round of chemo and then surgery and then another round of chemo and so i would ask that you keep my friend elizabeth in your prayers i'm going to come around with a microphone for our joys and concerns yes mary I'd like to ask for prayers for my sister-in-law, Janet, and her husband, Mitch. Um, Janet has her own health issues, but Mitch has been suffering from Parkinson's for a number of years and had started with some dementia, but this week he fell twice and is now hospitalized with um, rapidly increasing dementia problems um, and Parkinson's, and he also was diagnosed with COVID. So it's been a really rough week and they are now having to investigate um, nursing homes for Mitch to uh, move into. So prayers for Janet and Mitch. It's been a very difficult journey. Yes, Carla. Mike is having carpal tunnel surgery on Tuesday. We're told it's a simple procedure, but just prayers that all goes well. We're praying for you, Mike. Yes, Jenny. Prayers for Jan Paulson. Um, she has had treatment, but she's still not able to come out and participate. And uh, she has pain and um, very limited motion in her right shoulder. Prayers for Jan Paulson for her shoulder. It's creating real struggles. Pat, I'm coming your way. Thank you. Um, 
thank you to everyone who has been so very kind uh, for the cards, for the messages, certainly for Pastor Laura for visiting John, certainly for those of you who thought enough of him too to come and visit and just help to brighten his day and my day. He's really doing very well. Um, he is able to uh, get, of course, use his walker to dress himself, to get around. Um, this week we practice getting in and out of the car. Tomorrow we go to see the orthopedic doctor. Hopefully that's the good news that we get and that he will be able to come home. So really special prayers today that the news is good tomorrow. So, but thanks again for everything. Thank you, Pat. It's good to hear good news. And we'll keep praying for John and yourself. Friends, God is good. God hears our prayers. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Wondrous Lord of both the sunshine and the rain, we give you thanks for gathering us together this day to glorify, honor, and worship you. We pray, dear Lord, our prayers of joy, celebrating Riley's achievements, celebrating John Ellis's continued healing and Carl Moeller's continued healing. God, you have blessed us indeed. We see the blessings and opportunity for breaking bread together, for fellowship, opportunities to learn together, to grow together, and opportunities to judge one another's chili, as we did last week. Lord, we have been blessed indeed with times of joy, with times of community. And we lift up to you now our personal private prayers of joy. Lord, to you be the honor and the glory and the praise. We pray this day for those whom we love, praying your healing touch upon Jan Paulson, that you would watch over here, dear Lord, and that she would be able to get better. We pray for Mike Robinson's surgery this week, dear Lord, that it would be a simple procedure, and God, that all may go well. We pray this day for John Ellis's continued recovery, that tomorrow's meeting would bring about good news and good things. And God, we pray for Elizabeth Wallace, that you would give her strength and that you would give her a sense of your abiding love and presence. And Lord, we pray for your, your healing touch upon her. God, we pray this day for all those whom we love who are in need of your care. And we pray silently now our prayers of concern. Lord, hear our prayer. Hear us as we pray for Mitch and for Janet, for healing touch upon them, dear Lord, that you would watch over them. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray oh, for our friends at the border, for the Adamses, the Maldonados, as they continue their ministry at the border. Dear Lord, we pray that you would bless them indeed. And God, we lift up to you our sister church in Lichenza, Malawi, asking your blessing upon them. And God, we pray for Pavatso, our world vision child in South Africa. Lord, we lift up to you our nation as we move steadily through the uh, primaries, particularly the Republican primaries. God, we pray for peace. We pray for wisdom. We pray, dear God, that you would watch over this nation. And Lord, as we look at so much pain in this world, at wars that we've somehow gotten used to, wars that just keep on going, wars that are heartbreaking and horrific. God, we pray for all places where people are hurting, that you would bring comfort. And Lord, that you would teach us to put down our our weapons and that we would become forces for peace for love in this world god when will humans learn to love one another god we pray that you would go with us into this new week 
guide all that we think, say, and do, that in thought, word, and deed we may be so blessed as to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Taylor Strang, our Christian Education Director and our Days for Girls Director, she sent me a text this week letting me know that the Days for Girls team has completed 18 bags. And so if you go down to Wilson Hall or if you ask Sandy or Taylor, I'm sure they would be happy to show you or this Wednesday, if you come at 10 o'clock or anytime really between 10 and two, you can see this really wonderful ministry that is happening. Well done, Days for Girls team, to all of you who have been volunteering and sewing and cutting things and ironing things. Oh, it has just been wonderful. And so our tithes and our offerings support keeping this building running so that we can keep sewing machines running. Praise be to God and keep the irons from blowing a fuse. And so... Thank you for your support through your tithes and your offerings. Let us say a prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Lord, as we give of our tithes and our offerings, either in the back of the sanctuary today as Elder Mary Abbott holds basket or online at shopchurch.org, God, we pray that you would use these, the gifts of our tithes and our offerings, that they may be used for the sake of your glory and the sake of your kingdom. Amen. Please stand as comfortably able for the doxology. You may be seated.
Christ. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke's gospel, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. You are invited to follow along in our liturgy with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son of our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and the needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and the grape juice, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in your final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm through Christ with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The elders may come forward at this time to remove the covers. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes in glory. 
Beloved in Christ, we are partaking of communion today by coming forward. We will start with the back pews coming down the center aisle and go to the corresponding elder. You can partake of the bread. They will say the body of Christ given for you. And you may say amen or thanks be to God and partake right there. And then go to the next elder who has the cup. They will say the blood of Christ shed for you. You may say thanks be to God or amen, partake, and then go to the next elder who will have the basket. You can put the empty cup in the basket before using the side aisles to return to your pew. If you need the elders to come to you for mobility purposes, they're keeping an eye out. They've got you. Beloved in Christ, because there is one loaf, we, many as we are, are one body, for it is one loaf of which we all partake. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? When we give thanks over the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may come forward.
Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's children said, Amen. Let us stand as comfortably able for our closing hymn, hymn number 507, I Come With Joy. Now receive this blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Amen.